My guest in this week's Response to Innovation story is Martin Richardson. He's professor of modern holography at the Montfort University in Leicester in the United Kingdom, where he leads the Holographic Research Center. Martin is regarded as an imaging pioneer and made holograms for many famous people, including film directors Martin Scorsese and Alan Parker and rock star David Bowie. Every year he operates courses for the film industry together with commercial partners such as Panasonic. In 2002, he was awarded the prestigious Shearwater Foundation Award for Achievements in Holographic Art. And in 2009, he received the Royal Photographic Society Saxby Medal in recognition for achievements and contributions to the advancements of holographic imaging. Martin, thank you very much for taking the time for this interview today. Thank you very much and welcome to my home in London. When I talk to people about holograms, many people say, well, is this the same way as in Star Wars, first movie when Princess Leia was giving her yeah. message? To, so that's, that's one of the most famous, iconic uh, pictures that comes into mind. How, yeah. how far are we away from such a kind of technology? Um, it's one of the biggest questions in holography, of course, because the, the hologram in Star Wars was um, science fiction. And when we're working with the laws of physics, we have to remember that it's actually impossible to focus a photon in thin air. So part of, part of my, my teaching process is to, first of all, disillusion people. I'd say, well, you've seen the Star Wars. That's not real holography. That's a, that's a film effect. But there are ways emerging using um, holographic optical elements, which are also used um, in Microsoft for um, holographic technology, which overlap the world of holography with the real world, but that's augmented reality. In Star Wars, what you see is an image projected into space independently of any technology. And so, you know, I don't think we're ever going to reach the Star Wars hologram, but we're, we're trying to. Mm -hmm. um, if you'd asked me that question 20 years ago, I'd say I'm 20 years time. Now I'm not 20 years this year, and I'm not so certain we're ever going to reach the ultimate Star Wars uh, fantasy. But um, the interesting thing about holography, and this is the application of holography into the real world, is we're all, we're all trying to reach a science fiction fantasy, but it's the spin-offs, the interesting technical spin-offs that we learn about and we can use within the real world, which are perhaps more beneficial to society as a whole. Could you give me some examples of such spin-offs? Um, yeah, so uh, everyone is carrying maybe three or four holograms around with them now. So beginning with uh, bank cards, your credit cards has a hologram, it's an embossed hologram. We're using holograms in passports on currency. But the actual big push at the moment is using holograms within virtual reality headsets in augmented reality. And this type of hologram is called a holographic optical element. And the element is being fed by very, very small projectors in the, the AR glasses, which are then refracting and diffracting light back into our eyes. So it appears that the three-dimensional image is in real space. Do you see any specific challenges in the area of holography that might raise these issues? So is it about the, the presence being here or somewhere or anywhere at the same time? Do we lose the sense of yeah. location? Precisely that. That's, that's one of the side effects that we are beginning to experience through uh, three-dimensional telepresence, for example. I'm working on a research project at the moment where we're developing a virtual presence. And this has been, this has been accelerated because of the current pandemic uh, uh, problems that we have. So, yes, that is going to be a major issue in the future, I think, where it's no longer necessary for us to travel. We'll, we will lose the nuance of being in the company of somebody else who's real 
you know, the mini gestures, the facial expressions to a certain extent, the smell. And, you know, this, this is uh, it's going to be an area that we have to look at very seriously, I think. Do you think that there will be one day where we'll have a kind of holographic mobile phone, holographic computer display, or holographic TV set? So the thing is, we when you're looking at reality, it's, it's very tiring for the eyes. We have a biological filter which filters out something like 80% of what's going on around us. So it's no good us having a, a box, as you say, or a three-dimensional display that looks like reality because it's not necessary. What we have found in three-dimensional television and filmmaking in the past five years is we only need a very shallow three-dimensional illusion of depth to draw us in. You know, you don't want to sit down at night, um, you know, relaxing, watching it, watching some newscast broadcasts of, um, I don't know, some war in, a, in a, a faraway place and be drawn into it. It's, it's not entirely necessary. And actually, our eyes relax at a point where I think the, the ultimate three-dimensional depth is something like 10 centimeters. So we are we, we're held back to a certain extent from by our evolved biology of the perception of, of seeing. That's not to say what you're looking for, you know, the, the window to the real world is impossible. Yes, of course it's possible. And it's going to evolve in ways which we can only imagine now. But one, I'll give you a couple of clues there. So if we're looking at a box, a three-dimensional box, it means that we can look around. We can see hidden things. It becomes almost like a candid form of representation where the things are no longer directed at the actor or the, the producer or the presenter. We're also looking at what's going on in the corner over there because maybe that's more interesting. So the standard format of two-dimensional flat screen technology will eventually disappear and we will start seeing more curved type of outcode holograms where you can move in, you can look around, you can, at some point, if you, if you wish, through, again, through um, artificial intelligence, take the role of the actor, of an actor or a player within the, the scenario. How could holograms help us to become more collaborative or okay. more creative? Yes. Now, that's a beautiful question. So the work which is going on within the holographic tail presence research area is astounding. Some of the things I've seen coming from research labs, particularly at MIT and the work of uh, Professor Mike Bove, is incredible. So if we're thinking of having a a holographic presence, a holographic teacher, for example, I think the attention span of the holographic teacher is far more than the two-dimensional uh, current Zoom teacher that we see. We know young people have very small attention spans. People today are bombarded literally every two seconds by a different image, different text, different sound. There's something about the pureness of a three-dimensional holographic tail presence which goes deeper into the, the educational aspect of what the teacher is trying to explain to the student. Could be math, could be English, it could be art. It takes on a different it's on a different meaning and it's perhaps using a different area of our minds to to appreciate that presence. The big problem we have in reaching that is the production of a rewritable screen with 
a high enough resolution. We're, we're, we're pretty dumb at the moment, you know. Even with 8K resolution, it's still not enough. To have a real three-dimensional holographic screen resolution, you must have something in the region of 50K. And that in itself carries all sorts of problems regarding thermodynamics and the heat of the screen, the cooling system you use, the type of electronics in that you start to use. So part of the system, if we're going that route, if we're looking at the holographic television system route, will be the inclusion of, of holograms within the actual uh, fundamental electronics and the way the electronics are functioning, similar to fiber optics and the way we're using fiber optic communication to, to communicate with the internet. So, you know, it comes back to the laws of physics, the thermodynamics, the, the resolution, the, the number of photons capable, how many, you know, which frequencies do we use, uh, which combination. But of course, all this is going to be possible. And it's going to be possible because of the revolution currently taking place in laser technology. When I began 40 years ago, the lasers I used were three meters by, you know, 60 centimeters. They were water cooled, uh, three phased, enormous beasts, capacitor banks. Now it's possible to get the same thing the size of a, a centimeter doing exactly the same thing. Is hologram in art just a hologram of art, or is hologram in art a new way of art? Can a hologram do something that we couldn't do by simply carrying around paintings and people? Yes, I believe it can. I believe it can. Remember, it's a new art form. And the, the Mona Lisa was expressing the Renaissance idea of perspective. Time has moved on. I think we understand classical perspective now in art more than ever. Art has come to a standstill. People are looking for new expressions. This is why we have such a huge movement in Europe, I think, for conceptualism, conceptual art. But the, even the ideas can only go so far be before we need some form of intellectual transport for them to take to a new level. So holography and art is going to be a huge um, 21st century movement, I'm sure. I'm seeing it already with my students. The combination of physics and art together is beautiful. My lab based in Leicester has some very large holograms, two by one meter in diameter. The size, the, the size is restricted by the materials. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, once we understand the materials fully, it will be possible to have a wall within your home as a hologram. As and a hologram, as a holographic picture, movie, or holographic uh, telepresence? As, as a holographic screen. Once you've got the screen, and the screen is capable of, of receiving holographic information from, from the internet, then you will have the real kind of holographic environment that we're all looking for. And this will happen. When do you think it will happen? My best honest guess is 20 years time, we'll have holographic um, virtual presences on our laptops, there'll be new screen technologies, the uh, communication systems that we're using have to advance. We have to move away from the electronic disc. But you know, we've come so far in the past 10 years with mobile communications. Nothing would surprise me. And that the rewards to be had, you know, from some of the big players like Microsoft, Google, Sony, 
are immense because the first one to cross the finishing line for the holographic telepresence mobile unit is the winner. It will sustain our interest for maybe the next 50 to 100 years. Mm -hmm. Long enough for us to evolve some of the ethical problems and benefits that we need to face. It was a pleasure talking to you. Well, very nice to talk to you as well. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Mm -hmm.